Good morning and welcome to Midweek Connection on Wednesday, March 23rd here at First Presbyterian Church. My name is Pastor Joel. And I'm David Welch. And today we're going to be reading from the daily lectionary passages on this day, having a chance to discuss them a little bit and then uh, and, and close in a word of prayer. So uh, let me open this in a word of prayer. Uh, gracious Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity that you give us to read your word and to discuss it together. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would be present and evident today and that we would be transformed by the words that we read today. Thank you for your love for us, Jesus, that we can love other people. Uh, so we thank you and we praise you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Starting this morning with our first psalm reading today, which is Psalm 5. And some of these, um, if you've been following along with us, uh, these psalms from the Daily Lectionary, uh, they do also follow their own internal cycle. There are psalms that are regularly read on Wednesdays, and since we typically do a midweek connection on Wednesday, uh, that's why we might be repeating some of these psalms, which is why it's important for us to be reading our, our passages throughout the week. Um, but also during different seasons, they tend to emphasize different psalms. Uh, and so uh, there are going to be repeats on psalms, but today we're, we are reading from Psalm 5. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Give heed to my sighing. Listen to the sound of my cry, my King and my God. For to you I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I plead my case to you and watch. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil will not sojourn with you. The boastful will not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in awe of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. For there is no truth in their mouths. Their hearts are destruction. Their throats are open graves. They flatter with their tongues. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Because of their many transgressions, cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, so that those who love your name may exalt in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover them with favor as with a shield. Our second psalm is Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. For he is gracious and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord, and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the speed of a runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. Our Hebrew scripture text today comes from Genesis chapter 45, starting in verse 16 and going through the end of the chapter. When the report was heard in Pharaoh's house, Joseph's brothers have come. Pharaoh and his servants were pleased. Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, Do this, load your animals, and go back to the land of Canaan. 
Take your father and your households and come to me so that I may give you the best of the land of Egypt and you may enjoy the fat of the land. You are further charged to say, do this. Take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives and bring your father and come. Give no thought to your possessions for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. The sons of Israel did so. Joseph gave them wagons according to the instruction of Pharaoh, and he gave them provision for the journey. To each one of them he gave a set of garments, but to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five sets of garments. To his father he sent the following, ten donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt, and ten female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and provision for his father on the journey. Then he sent his brothers on their way, and as they were leaving, he said to them, Do not quarrel along the way. So they went up out of Egypt and came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. And they told him, Joseph is still alive. He is even ruler over all the land of Egypt. He was stunned. He could not believe them. But when they told him all the words of Joseph that he had said to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. Israel said, Enough! My son Joseph is still alive. I must go and see him before I die. Our New Testament epistle is 1 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 13, the whole chapter. Now, concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Even, indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or in earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family, and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Our Gospel reading comes from Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 13 and extending to the end uh, through verse 29. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, It is Elijah. And others said, It is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, 
because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved. Yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The third psalm is Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I ask to the Lord, that will I seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy, I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger, you who have been my help. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Our final psalm today is Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. 
You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise, for you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. So, David, uh, I am regularly intrigued as to how these lectionary texts uh, interact with each other mm -hmm. and how we can see pretty similar themes in different places of scripture. Uh, I'm regularly reminded of, of the grand narrative arc that God has included in his word to us. Mm -hmm. And even though some of the texts uh, are telling you know, different stories, there's always some connection that I'm intrigued to find uh, when we look at these texts. Um, you know, for example, if, if we're looking at the, the Genesis passage where, uh, obviously, if you've been reading along in your lectionary texts, you know that Joseph had gone down to Egypt and had been sold, um, Joseph had been sent to Egypt, sold as a slave, uh, but now he's in this position of power and authority, and he has the opportunity to uh, exact vengeance on his brothers, mm -hmm. but instead, uh, they uh, Joseph's family receives great blessings from Pharaoh of Egypt, of all people. We know later on that Pharaoh does enslave the Hebrews, but here, Pharaoh is happy to hear that Joseph and his family are coming down, that there's going to be a way that Pharaoh will be even blessed by being in the presence of Joseph's family. Um, and even if they're looking at all of the gifts that Pharaoh has given to the family, uh, at the end, Jacob, when he hears that Joseph is alive, he, he cries out, enough, my son Joseph is still alive, I must go see him before I die. That there's, uh, that, that greater than the joy of material blessings is the knowledge that his son is alive, mm -hmm. and that his son has, has shown mercy upon his brothers, and that he is then able to be back reunited with his family. Uh, and, and, and I think if we look at the uh, Corinthians passage in particular, following that one, how Paul is again reminding us of the importance of family, the importance of faith, the importance of community. Uh, there's this whole idea of the abundance of God being present. You know, God provides the food that we eat. Um, but because of misperceptions that we have, uh, uh, especially people back in the first century, I would argue even people today, uh, do we eat food that is available to us, even if it's been sacrificed to an idol, or if it's, um, I guess, maybe a modern equivalent today, people could put uh, certain restrictions or dietary controls or whatever might happen to be. How can we be full participants with God's abundant blessings uh, while maintaining peace within the community and, and love and service of the community. So, so again, what we find to be more important than the material blessings is how those material blessings are being used. Yeah. Are we using them uh, to bring glory to God? Are we using them to continue with the family of faith? Mm -hmm. um, and 
one one other thing that I wanted to make, and I'd love to get your thoughts on it as well, is just the contrast between what we see in in Psalm fifty one and what we read in Mark chapter six, mm-hmm. where uh, where Herod makes a really rash vow that he will offer uh, to his daughter who has pleased him in some sort of sensual dance up to half of his kingdom where he is treating uh, the, the great material blessings that he has, you know, either uh, through his shrewdness or whatever. Nonetheless, Herod was a rich man and he was using, treating those with contempt for some sensual pleasure from his daughter uh, and makes a rash vow and ends up then uh, killing, beheading John the Baptist. And what I find interesting about that is it says that he was sorrowful for the rash vow that he had made, uh, yet continues and, and fulfills that execution because he was afraid of how he might appear in the eyes of his courtiers and others around him. Um, and in the connection that I was thinking about with Psalm 51 is that whole idea of uh, sacrifices that are acceptable to God of the broken spirit and the broken and contrite heart. Mm-hmm. And I wonder how the story could have been different if Herod had just repented of his sin, if he had just repented of his rash vow, yeah. you know, what God could have done maybe in Herod's heart. Uh, but instead, uh, he, he, fulfills, he fulfills his evil plan, basically. Uh, John the Baptist is killed, and Herod then doesn't get to experience the blessings that are available from Psalm 51. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I, I agree. And I, I think the connection I see between the uh, Genesis passage and the Corinthians passage and the Mark passage are um, that... Uh, we have to have our our priorities uh, correct according according to the priorities of the kingdom. So in in uh, Genesis, as you as you pointed out, you know, Jacob is an old man. Uh, you know, he's lived a long life. He's partially blind, uh, as we will see later in the story, um, and and yet you know, the, the the material gifts that that he receives from Pharaoh, that's not that's not important to him. Right? What's important to him most of all is going to see his son Joseph. And I, I think a lot of us can understand that, right? That um, and and it, it's uh, it's that's not too difficult of a lesson. Right? I think most of us probably uh, value our children more than our material possessions. I, I would hope, uh, although. Um, on a daily basis, maybe we don't we don't always uh, we don't always demonstrate that. Maybe uh, maybe certain uh, possessions uh, we value uh, we value too much. Mm-hmm. And it's not that possessions or material things are are bad. It's just that we have to have our priorities straight. Mm-hmm. It's the order in which we value them. And so I think you see that in the First Corinthians passage as well, where Paul is talking to believers. Who know that idols are are not real gods and that they have no power over them, and so in that context, um, you know, back in back in that first century, first second century context, when uh, there are multiple gods and temples all over the city of Corinth, um, and you never know whether the meat you're eating had been sacrificed to an idol and then subsequently sold in the marketplace. Uh, Paul tells Christians, look, you know that idols are, are fake gods, and so they have no power over you, and so it doesn't really matter whether you eat the food or not. However, there are those in the church who used to worship idols, and because their conscience is weak, uh, because uh, they're just beginners in the faith, they don't have that knowledge yet. So rather than despising them for their lack of knowledge, uh, we should, in a sense, come down to their level. It's better to give up meat than to offend a brother or sister. 
Um, and I think, well, are there, are there ways that that could apply in our present context? I think of things like, uh, like maybe the consumption of alcohol, which is offensive to some. Um, and I, I think, uh, you know, it's good uh, reformed Christians. Maybe we know that the consumption of alcohol is not morally wrong as long as it's consumed within moderation. And yet there are those who, for whom alcohol has been a stumbling block in their lives. And so uh, maybe maybe we uh, forbear from that in their in their presence rather than um, rather than prioritizing our knowledge, we prioritize love for our brothers and sisters. Um, I think the same is uh, in, is in the story with uh, Herod, uh, as you, you said, Joel. He he um, goes ahead and kills John the Baptist because of his guests and on account of his his rash vow. He doesn't want to be embarrassed in front of the uh, people that he's invited to this um, to this party. And so that shows where his priorities are, right? He likes John, he fears John, he knows he is a righteous man, and yet for Herod, his priorities are misaligned, right? He's more afraid to be embarrassed uh, in front of his guests, uh, more afraid to offend his, his wife and, and um, the daughter than, uh, than to lay hands on a prophet, on a righteous man of God. Mm. Um, and so... Uh, yeah, I think I think in our own lives we we constantly get our priorities mixed up, but um, thanks be to God that there's grace and that He um, extends grace to a contrite uh, spirit. Right. The answer is to repent. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Thanks, David, for sharing that. I I was thinking in the, the even that first line from Psalm 27 that we read. Uh, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? I think maybe there's a, a, a little double meaning in that, in, in the sense of we don't need to fear anything else outside in this world because God is ultimately uh, our light and our salvation. But maybe even there's a little double meaning in that. Whom shall I fear? Well, maybe I should rightly fear God, who is the one who has authority over all things in this world. Um, yeah, and maybe if we did a little more of that, we'd do a little less of things that are displeasing to him. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for um, engaging in this conversation with me, and thank you to all of you who are watching, and if you do have uh, questions or comments, we are happy to field those. And uh, again, we do worship here on Sunday mornings at First Presbyterian Church San Angelo at 1030 on Sunday mornings. We would love for you to join us. And if you can't join us in person, we do broadcast. Uh, from time to time, we do get some technical difficulties. I heard there were some problems with the live stream last week, and we do apologize for that. Uh, but uh, we, are, we are grateful for the opportunity that technology gives us to connect in ways that we might not be ordinarily able to. But please, if you are able, please come and worship with us. And let's continue to challenge one another as we grow in faith through uh, listening to God's word and worshiping together in spirit and in truth. Uh, let me close this in a word of prayer. Heavenly, uh, Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your word to us. And Lord, what a challenging word it always is. Uh, Lord, in the ways that our uh, spirit um, is not yet uh, fully conformed to the image of your son, Jesus. And so when we read these words, they do challenge us. But Lord, how gracious and merciful you are to give us your word that we can be more thoroughly transformed into the image of your son jesus christ so i ask lord that that you will continue to bless us uh, through your word through your holy spirit through conversation with one another um, and uh, lord let us always remember to make our priorities straight before you uh, let us not fear the uh, the issues and concerns of this world uh, but let us have a right and appropriate fear and respect uh, for you, our God and our King. We thank you for this time and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, have a good day. Take care.